Hand loaders and bullet casters, welcome back to my bench. Welcome back to our little cast bullet 762 by 39 project. And I've got a few things I want to talk about today because if you've already gone through my series on bullet path through my cast bullet success playlist, uh, you'll understand where I'm going. If you haven't, you know, check out that playlist when we get done here. It's going to make things make a whole lot more sense. But just like in my recent video where I had a shop talk about this cartridge and these CIP spec rifles, well, one thing I kept emphasizing is we've got to fit our bullets to the throat. And that goes with pretty much any firearm that utilizes a throat. And if we're going to run cast bullets, we've got to be mindful of measurements. So in that particular video, I discussed uh, that this is a CIP spec rifle and its dimensions might not be quite as obvious as what we think they're going to be. Now, normally when we think of 762 by 39, we think of these steel case bullets and they might right at about 311 thousandths in diameter. Uh, steel case cartridges, I think is, <laughs> I think I messed up the term. But yeah, I've pulled a few of these and they generally are pretty good, 0.311. And the misconception is that that must mean that the barrels have a 0.311 diameter. I have not seen this in the two 762 by 39 rifles that I've owned. However, they have both been European rifles, CIP spec, which is a little bit different. Actually, a lot a bit different if you think about it. Now, if you are unsure about what I mean by the throat, okay, because we talked about it a lot with revolvers. You know, these rifles typically have some level of a throat as well, and it's important to be able to know it and identify it when you're working with cast bullets. In your chamber, you've got a cutout that looks very much like this case here. You know, unless you're using like an old AK pattern rifle from European countries, it's pretty much going to look very similar to this. All right. Now, at the edge of the case mouth, inside your chamber, there is going to be some amount of space that exists without any rifling whatsoever. It could be a large amount of space or it could be a very small amount of space. But the rifling typically is not going to begin straight away from the case mouth. Well, we can't really tell any of this stuff because we can't see it, but what we can do is take a chamber casting. So the first thing you're going to need is some kind of chamber casting alloy. Okay, now this is a lot like lead. It's a lot like tin. But the thing is, it's not quite the same. It has an extremely low melting point. It will melt probably as low as 165 degrees. And it, I doubt you'll ever go 200 degrees without this thing being a molten puddle of mess. Okay, so the benefit there is it doesn't take much. This is well more than what you need. It will work, but you could even use something as simple as a hair dryer. You could use a heat gun. And, you know, there's plenty of options out there. So what we don't want to do is overheat the chamber. We don't want to get this thing glowing red. It's not lead, folks. So we don't need to get up to that, you know, 600, 700 degree range. All right. Now, you're going to have to have something to pour it into. You know, just be creative. You know, this is probably a coffee scooper of some sort. And I've just kind of you know, bend it together to make somewhat of a pour spout. It works very well. It works just fine. Uh, you will also need something to drive your slug out. This is an aluminum rod. It's uh, about three eighths in diameter. It's very soft. It's non-marring. Uh, you can use this. You can find it at most hardware stores. It's just basically stock rod and it might just be something that aluminum welders might like to purchase in order to do some of their work. Okay, you're also going to need some patches. Okay, 
because what you're going to end up doing is running a patch up very close to the chamber and you will use that to basically stop the alloy from pouring all the way down through your rifling to the muzzle because that's something that we don't want to have happen and I do like to roll up the patches pretty tight Okay, so what I'm going to do here at this point, I've got a dummy round, that same dummy round. It is resting in the bolt, and I'm just going to bring it in. And the reason I do this is just simply because it's a bad habit to push your extractor over the case rim if it is a controlled feed action. So at this point here, I'm going to push that patch up until I can feel that it is hit at the end of the round. Okay, so I got a nice sudden stop right there. So I know that the patch is actually kind of bearing right against the nose of the bullet. Go ahead and pull her out. And so at this point, what should be able to happen here is I should be able to get just enough of the rifling to see what the groove diameter looks like just forward of the throat. Now my chamber has already been preheated and it does have just a extremely light coat of oil in it so what I'm going to do now is uh, heat up you know, this alloy and it doesn't take much you really don't want to overheat it just because as you know if you're already a caster you know your alloys kind of have a working temperature it won't take too long uh, pretty much the residual heat I pull the flame away the residual heat is pretty much enough to get it you know in pretty good shape now I'm gonna pour from this end of the spout so I am gonna heat that up because I don't want it to cool and as far as preheating the chamber you can use you know I mean something as simple as a blow dryer you can use that same little torch but here we go it's time for the pour. And hopefully you can see that. I'm going to try to bring this camera in just a little bit more. There we are. I probably poured a little bit more than I really wanted to, but I think we should have ourselves a pretty good casting. So here is the chamber casting right next to a loaded round. And I was not able to get a shot of me driving it out because I was a dummy and I thought the camera was rolling and it was not. <laughs> so forgive me for that, guys. Uh, so what we see is a pretty close copy of the way the cartridge is designed. And this also is a pretty good slot for that cartridge to just fit into, you know. So this is a little bit more generous than what it has to be in order to accommodate this cartridge. So the throat area that we want to look at is going to be the area right here before the rifling begins. Okay, and I'll bring it a little bit closer to you. So hopefully you can kind of see that. Let's see here. Ah, there it is. You can see where the rifling begins. It's just just kind of a trace of lands right there. Okay, remember this is the inverse of the chamber. It's also the inverse of the barrel. 
and this is the patch that I have yet to take off. <laughs> there we are. There's not a problem with that patch. It obviously did its job. Okay, so at this point, there's a lot that we can tell. You know, we can tell how the chamber's cut. We can tell, uh, you know, possibly we might even want to determine brass length or see how much brass length we actually have to work with. Because once again, I'll put these side by side and you can tell with the chamber casting on the left that I have several more thousands to go before I most likely run out of room for a case mouth. That doesn't mean we want to be butted right up to it. That can be problematic. But that does give me some idea of, you know, the length of my brass and if I'm in a comfortable area. It also depicts, you know, the first section of rifling. So I can take a good measurement right here to determine what the groove diameter is at the start. And ideally, it ought to be the same diameter, you know, all the way to the muzzle end. That is not always the case, though. Again, we're dealing with CIP spec European rifle right here. Now, if you have a Ruger American, if you have an AR-15 chambered in this cartridge, uh, probably even a Ruger Mini, uh, you know, there's a good chance that being how it is an American-made cartridge, you're going to have a clean groove diameter of 0.311 all the way down to the muzzle. You know, the Americans have been very good about making sure that that is done correctly, whereas the Europeans, like I spoke about in my shop talk video, they're a little bit more concerned about making sure that sizes are no less than instead of, you know, not being much larger than either. It's just a different outlook, but it does require a little bit more special attention. So let's start taking some measurements now. For those of you who have a CZ527, you probably read the same instruction manual that I've got, and it says it's designed to shoot 311 diameter bullets. So in our thinking, a lot of times we assume that means that our groove diameter is a 311. Well, as you can see right here, I'm, I'm pushing 0.315. And as I bring it back a little bit further, we will see some increase. So my throat, where the edge of my jaws are on, is actually showing something larger than what I expected. Pretty close to 0.317. You know, I had been of the mind that this was about a 3.14. So as far as fitting bullets to the rifle, I can see now that I've got a little bit more room <laughs> to work with. I actually am shooting bullets that are about a .314. And I'll give you an example right here. It's pretty hard to find a bullet mold that will cast quite that large for you. So maybe my powder coating plans are going to pay off here pretty soon. So I've got a bullet that's unsized that's pushing, you know, right about where it needs to be. So yeah, I'm actually pretty close with this particular bullet here of being a dead match to the throat. But however, I still think I got a little bit of room to go. So, throat diameter, folks, it's important. We need to be prepared for those things. If we go into 762 by 39, just assuming everything's going to be a 0.311, we might be finding out the hard way that that is not the case, especially with our European variations of this cartridge. So, folks, that gave us a lot of information about what's going on right here in the chamber in the very part of the first section of the rifling. Uh, what it does not tell us is a whole lot about what's going on down here. So I'm going to follow this up with a pretty simple way to determine the groove diameter at the smallest point of the barrel. And I talked about this a good bit in the cast bullet success series. So by all means, go back, take a look at that. Thank you. God bless you. And I will see you again soon.